Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle. I'm your host, Chris Angle. The Philosophical Angle defines concepts in current media. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. They are available free for viewing at the website of www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is uh, our panelist, Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MA from Wharton, and an MA from Tufts. He's currently an independent investor. And the purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of concepts being used in media. And so today we're going to we're going to study the effects of regulations on corporate America and profits and the economy. We're going to start with an article from the New York, uh, from the, from the Wall Street Journal entitled, Trading Shifts Pinches New York Stock Exchange Profits. This article was of April 30th, and its subtitle was Big Board Sees High Speed Players Taking Volume to Lesser Regulated Venues. Net Profit Falls 44%. So I'm going to read you a little bit about this article, and uh, to, in order for you to get a little background of what's going on uh, regarding regulations and its effect on the economy. In the article by Jacob Bunge, it says, Regulatory scrutiny around high-speed trading strategies appears to be pushing the business away from stock exchanges and into lesser regulated platforms, such as dark pools, according to the top executives of the New York Stock Exchange, Euronext Incorporated. Later on in the in the uh, Article, it says, high-speed traffic traders pull back from registered exchanges like those run by New York Stock Exchange Euronext adds to headwinds facing the market operator, which on Monday reported a 44% net profit decline, driven by widespread drought <coughs> in trading. I'm also going to go to a second article by Scott Peterson, and also in the Wall Street Journal, on May 6th, entitled, Confusion Still Reigns on Volcker Rule Date. And I'll read from this article also. At issue is whether the Fed is requiring banks to start scaling back on making bets with their own money almost immediately, or whether they can continue until the ban on such activity goes in effect in two years. And that is the effect of the uh, Federal Reserve regulation, which emanates from Dodd-Frank, is uh, being implemented. And there's a little bit of confusion whether it's an immediate concern or one that will happen over the next two years. In, a, an, in an April 19th statement, the Fed attempted to clarify the Volcker Rule, a cornerstone of Dodd-Frank financial overhaul. The rule aims to limit risk trading by U.S. banks, including restrictions on their ability to trade with their own money. The debate since the attempted clarification shows the difficulties regulators face in writing and implementing all of the new rules mandated by the 849-page law, ranging from new regulations of derivatives to rules covering obscure minerals. Further, the article states, banks have been growing jittery 
about compliance requirements for the rule as its official implementation date is July 21st. <clears throat> So, the question here today, as we've noted here in the New York Stock Exchange, profit has plummeted since, uh, since uh, regulation uh, problems have convened on its, uh, on its uh, profit margin. We're going to discuss why that is. So let's go to our notes here and uh, discuss it. First of all, let's, uh, let's note that risk, obviously, is the potential for detrimental effects. Everything that we do economically has a reward. We make a sacrifice to get a reward. And in our sacrifice, we use our risk, our information and knowledge, our time, our effort, if it's a service. And if it's a material product, then we add in material to the equation. Those uh, variables put into a sacrifice, because we sacrifice our risk, we sacrifice our our time, we use our information and knowledge, we sacrifice our, our effort, and we use our material in order to construct a reward for just about everything we do in life. So, first I'd like to point out that regulations operate on the left side of the equation. Regulations are a derivative of law. First, law is made, and then regulators come around government, really a government appointees and, and functionaries uh, are appointed by the law and uh, effect and write out regulations regarding commerce or, or whatever it is that the concerns the law. In this case, it's the New York Stock Exchange uh, that has suffered um, the detriments of a regulation regarding, uh, regarding high-speed trading. Also, we've got the vocal rule sitting with its 800 and some odd pages of regulations uh, coming online, which may affect the banks. So what happens here is that regulations limit opportunity. And, it, and the opportunity here is to make profit. Really, regulations are nothing else, or uh, opportunity is nothing else, but the flip side of, ri of risk. For example, if you have a, if here you are in the midst of uh, doing what you do uh, uh, in your daily life, and you decide that you want to make an investment, let's say you want to make an investment in the stock market, what happens is that you take risk on from the investment and receive that risk. In other words, risk has direction. So when you uh, take on, say you buy a share of Ford Motor Company, you accept the risk that that investment may not do well in the future. But for that, you accept the opportunity also that it may do well in the future. So it's really the flip side of the same coin. You could also take that risk. Let's say you have a risk on, you buy a house, or you buy a car. You take on a risk, risk of ownership. A, a tree could fall on that house. It could fall on the car, too. You could smash the car. But you don't want that risk. So what you do is you sell that risk to an insurance company. And that, in that case, the risk goes away from you to another entity, as well as does the opportunity to make money from that risk. So the insurance company 
acquires the risk and it also acquires the opportunity to make a profit on your risk. So, regulations come along and they operate on the left side on the risk. And they'll say, well, you can't do this or you can't do that. In other words, it cuts down risk and that's what the, most of the, uh, the, the essence of regulations. Congress says, okay, well, we shouldn't have the risk of, uh, of the, uh, the environment uh, being subjected to this, these manufacturers. So we will make a law saying uh, there can be no uh, uh, environmental uh, effluence from uh, this, uh, these manufacturers. So we'll have a, we'll say that uh, uh, we'll eliminate this, this type. Uh, so what happens is that uh, this regulation comes around and limits the amount of opportunity those manufacturers have to make a product and for that product they will receive a reward. So regulations not only limit risk but also they limit the opportunity to make a reward at the same time. And that's the problem here, and that's what we want to discuss. And this comes from the idea uh, that the purpose of government is to, one of the main purposes of the government, is to protect man from his fellow man. And uh, as well as well uh, delineated uh, by uh, John Stuart Mill, in his uh, philosophical writings in the late 1800s. So let's, uh, with that opening statement, let's ask Rick if he agrees with what has been said so far. Rick? Yeah. Um, in the context of that specific article, uh, why liquidity essentially is leaving, uh, whether it's the New York Stock Exchange or one of the other big exchanges, um, because of regulatory intervention. Uh, there is one additional element to this, and that is uh, price protection. Uh, one of the traditional roles of investment banks is to serve as an intermediary between uh, large asset managers or other parties in some cases that want to trade large blocks of stock. And as an asset manager, when I want to get rid of something or I want to buy something, uh, if the block is large enough, uh, and it is fed into the market incrementally, it can move the price. And right. that's how the whole block trading business, which the banks are very active in. And when, when they talk about bring, putting risk on, on, on the book, uh, one of the ways they put risk on the book is simply serving as an intermediary in that process. So if I'm Morgan Stanley, I'll buy a big block of stock from Fidelity and then sell it to capital. But because I have a big balance sheet, at, for a very short period of time, that agreement can be made in advance and in, technically I'm, I'm at risk because the price can move in that period of time. But in reality, if that trade is set up properly, it moves not at all or very little. And both clients are happy because they have price protection. They know what I'm selling it for and what I'm buying it for, period. One price, simple. So with that caveat, uh, 
let me comment on regulatory impact. I think, you know, the Dodd-Frank regulations and the Volcker rule, uh, part of the problem is the density. You mentioned the 800 pages. Well, anything that complicated is going to be very, very expensive to implement. And I lived through that uh, with Sarbanes-Oxley, and I, I know the, all those procedures and what a waste of time it was in the sense that many managers were brought into the process in a very tangential way just to sign off on forms that had no real impact on how the business was managed, but were merely for the requirements of satisfying Surbanus Oxley uh, regulations. All right, let me restate that very, very carefully. When I was in the investment banking business, I saw numerous instances where we were signing off on forms uh, which were meant to affect how risk was managed, but actually did not, but were rather for the sake of crossing the T's and dotting the I's as they were specified in their Sarbanes Oxley regulations. The same thing is going to happen with Dodd Frank. Well, that's a really good it's point, and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, it really brings up the the uh, the idea of of a risk reward ratio in the decision making process. And what happens is that the the, uh, the a regulation will be written, and the regulation will have a an impact on the uh, on the risk and opportunity side of the equation, and then will have a a a, a an impact on the reward also. And so when regulators make, uh, or, or Congress initially and regulators secondarily, make their laws and regulations affecting the uh, opportunities of the American market that are presented in, in, in the economy, <clears throat> each one of those has a risk-reward ratio. In other words, you're eliminating, uh, uh, you're, 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 you're eliminating opportunity, but then uh, the cost of that to the economy has to be considered. I don't think uh, that uh, uh, the lawmakers are considering any of the cost uh, that, that results from the elimination of uh, the opportunity here on the left side of the equation. Would you agree with that, Rick? Well, I'm certain they're not considering that part of it much. And I think it's worse than that, than that, actually. We now have a hybrid system. Maybe we always did, but it's now become underscored by the fact that, that implicitly the largest financial institutions are henceforth, under the current regulatory framework, guaranteed. Whether it's Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan, the implicit guarantee, the backstop, is now in place. So if those things, those entities get into trouble again, or uh, become technically bankrupt, the U.S. government is now implicitly obligated to come in and bail them out. That's a very dangerous situation to be in, but that's where we are. And the problem, as I see it, the central problem with Dodd-Frank and the central problem with the Volcker Rule is it wasn't prop trading that brought these firms down. Right, it uh, it, it, that's right. Uh, it, it, as they reported that they were profitable sections of the company, it was the uh, it was of course the uh, the mortgage business that brought them down. But the uh, the pro uh, proprietary pro the proprietary desks on which the trading is done uh, were uh, constantly and and perennially uh, making money for the corporation. And that's why they're eager to be able to consider them. I know that they don't want to shut them down, and they're asking uh, this as this article states the very last minute that they can uh, be allowed to trade because it's a profit center for the corporation. But yet the regulation, it's, it's eliminating this opportunity and, uh, and thus uh, uh, it'll bring down their profit in the future. Uh, <clears throat> sorry to, to interrupt you, Rick. Agreed. I don't, I don't see any, any real danger. I mean, if you, what are hedge funds? Hedge funds are prop desks that have left the investment banks. And you don't see them generally going bankrupt left and right. Why is that? 
That's because why are the investment banks at such risk, and these hedge funds seem to sail on through these crises? Why is, is that? Uh, that's because the uh, exactly uh, the uh, the hedge funds are free to operate with less regulations. They don't have Dodd Frank on top of them, uh, although they uh, it looks like they they do have to register with the SEC uh, uh, now, and uh, they're able to make their own risk reward ratio decisions which include really risk opportunity reward decisions uh, in making their, and they, and they, uh, and given their own money, they uh, make them carefully and make uh, uh, considered uh, and uh, uh, well positioned uh, uh, bets on, on where they want to go and, to ma and, and, and ultimately uh, do well in making profits. Um, it's, uh, so I, I really think that uh, the investment bank, and I think the vocal rule also is trying to eliminate uh, the tie-up between banks and bank and investment banking. Uh, uh, is 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 that, do I read that correctly, Rick? Well, I, I think it's it's a very artificial line. They attack a, a long-standing controversy in the banking world. A more direct way would be to introduce Glass-Steagall, frankly. I mean, if you really want to uh, inoculate the banks from investment banking risk, then you'd reintroduce Glass-Steagall. That would be a much more direct, and you could argue old-fashioned, but it would be a much more direct approach. The problem with the Volcker rule as it's currently formulated is it doesn't attack the central issue of gross risk. The reason the investment banks went nearly bankrupt is because of gross risk. They thought they were hedged. They thought with all these CDOs and other derivatives instruments, they had offsetting positions that would hedge them. So they're, in, in their own books, they figured that their level of risk was minimal. The problem is, when you have a tail event, as we saw in 2008, assets move with very, very high levels of correlation. So the hedges all fall apart. All right? And the investment banks weren't smart enough to foresee that you can't survive on capital uh, uh, Lot, uh, capital ratios of you know a few percentage points, as in the case of Lehman, where they were, you know, thirty times levered and all that yes, stuff. Yes, I read forty-four to one; they had been leveraged. Yes. Right. I mean, that th that was a level of risk taking relative to the notion that they were actually hedged. That you know, with the benefit of hindsight, is ridiculous and was mismanagement. That was mismanagement. Right. Uh, you mean so, Le Lehman's was mismanaged, whereas the uh, uh, rest of the banking community might not have been. Is that what you uh, just asserted? Yes. Uh, and, and now that we have guaranteed the large banks and investment banks, we, are, we have to deal with that legacy. Either we remove that guarantee, all right, or we have to impose some restrictions on the gross level of exposure they have, not just the net, the gross, including all the derivatives okay. and now all like the to, offsetting Okay, positions. I'd like to now get back to the general summation of or, or, or a general conclusion uh, to uh, today's program, which is the, the uh, general effects of regulations on, uh, on, on an economy. In other words, uh, can, we, uh, can we agree that uh, in effect, uh, regulations, uh, and especially the ones that, that are written, uh, uh, like uh, Dodd Frank, which is uh, 800 and some odd pages, and I actually I read also that the number of pages written by Congress and the regulators last year was uh, in excess of 70,000 pages. Um, that uh, the more regulations uh, takes out uh, the opportunity, that uh, takes away risk, that uh, also uh, impairs uh, uh, reward. Um, uh, and the reward, and if you take out enough reward from the economy, the economy is not going to grow because it's been opportunity impaired. Uh, any, um, any statement, any final statement in our con concluding argument here, Rick? 
Well, I think most of the regulations, particularly the consumer protection uh, stuff, will prove to be a uh, more of a burden than anything else, and it will raise the costs of dealing in the financial industry. All right, so many, many thousands of those pages are unnecessary in the context of our already having sufficient regulations historically to treat these matters. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I would, uh, as that, however, uh, and as a, a last note, note uh, uh, there are uh, of course redundant uh, regulations where uh, many of the governmental uh, organizations uh, that put out all their regulations often do are duplicated uh, and uh, with having several different types of, of departments regulating the same uh, economic activity. So uh, thank, you, uh, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Rick, and, uh, and I hope you liked our discussion on government regulation and its impact on the economy. We'll see you next week. This was The Philosophical Angle. Thank you. <laughs>